off to college season. Here we go. That's what I'm doing this afternoon is helping my middle son pack up. We're packing the car. We're driving up to Charlottesville, kind of splitting it up. We'll go Tuesday evening for three or four hours and then kind of finish it up on Wednesday and then into the dorm on Thursday. A lot of other parents doing the same thing as well. So we thought it only appropriate to talk on this week's program about some of the ways that you can pay for college. Hopefully you've thought about that before you start packing up the car and driving off. And also looking ahead to tax season, some of the tax credits that you may find that you are eligible for. So welcome to Dollars and Cents. My name is Joel Garris. This happens to be one of the longest running radio program in Central Florida, coming to you on a variety of networks throughout Central, the Central Florida region. As we do each and every week, we strive to help make sense of all of those different decisions that have anything to do with your dollars. So busy week ahead for me personally, right? frankly, a busy afternoon because we got to finish up packing up the car and uh, getting ready to drive off to the University of Virginia where I'm dropping my middle son. And uh, of course, this past week actually wound up being a little bit busier than, than normal as well. So we got some exciting news to share with you on that. A bit of a recognition for uh, the great team at Nelson Financial Planning. We were named as the People's Choice Award for the best of Central Florida, which is a television show. Two co-hosts on that, Justin Clark and Michaela Nichols, and it airs noon on Sunday. So that's not this Sunday at noon, although they do have their show on, uh, and I forget what the topic is, but next week at noon on WKMG, which is News 6, the local CBS affiliate here in the greater Orlando region. We're going to be featured as the People's Choice on the Best of Central Florida television show. So I had an opportunity this past week to go in to the studios there at Channel 6, right there on John Young Parkway, and taped the program. So very excited about that. So we encourage you to watch. As I've always said, though, I have a face for radio, not so much for television. So Hence, we focus on the radio program. Anyway, with all of that, let's start digging into more of the headlines that occurred just this past week. And topic number one, and we talked a little bit about this last week on the program when we were joined by one of our certified financial fiduciaries at Nelson Financial Planning, Christina Lamb joined us. We were talking a little bit about inflation, the inflation reading that was going to come out in the coming week, which is now the past week. And if you're keeping score, and I suppose if you're walking down a grocery aisle, you know what the score is pretty clearly right now. But if you are keeping score, the latest reading, the July reading for inflation came out this past week, wind up, wound up being 5.4%. So we've got three months now, May, June, July, where inflation at 5% or more. At, at some point, it may not be able to be viewed as sort of this transitory, the economy reopening kind of thing, right? So the Federal Reserve may wind up not being able to sit on its hands for an indefinite period of time. So what does that mean? Well, what, what that means is, obviously, if inflation continues to stay at those rates, the Federal Reserve is going to have to do something to help combat inflation. That's one of its stated missions, its stated goals, if you will, is to make sure that inflation doesn't get too high. Because, as we all know, inflation eats away at the purchasing power of your dollars, right? If the gallon of milk is 25 cents more, that means you're spending an extra 25 cents that you didn't have to do before, and now that's the 25 cents that can't go someplace else. So that's kind of the tough impact of inflation. But when we think about the Fed, 
I think there's two things to be thinking about with, with the Fed in terms of what they are doing. So, so it, when we talk about the Fed starting to address some of these issues, th there's two pieces of the equation. And I think one of them is the one that everybody kind of knows about, which is the interest rates raising, increasing those, decreasing those. When the Fed cuts rates, we all kind of know that. It makes big headlines. But there's another thing that they're doing that they're going to have to slow down first before they get to the interest rate change, and that is the bond buying that they're doing. Just to put that into perspective, what that is, is that's the Federal Reserve going out into the bond market and purchasing US government bonds in order to provide a higher price, because you've got now a willing buyer, and that helps to stabilize the price, whereby by stabilizing the price or keeping the price pegged at a certain level, then you wind up keeping interest rates low. That's sort of the game that's being played there. It has to deal with the nuances of the bond market and how price and interest rate and things like that actually have an inverse relationship in that bond market, particularly when you're talking about US government security. So anyway, so they've got two things going on, the bond buying, and the interest rates. So they gotta slow down on the bond buying before they even get to the interest rates because that's kind of the, the sequence, if you will, uh, of, of events, right? When you get to interest rates where you've cut them down to like zero, then what else can you do? Well, you've gotta go in and support the interest rate through this bond buying program. Now, they're buying an awful lot. And, and the next couple of numbers that we're gonna give you may kind of make you think and scratch your head a little bit. So number one, they are buying the equivalent of $120 billion worth of bonds each month, not each year, each quarter, each month. That's $120 billion. And they, that's the pace that they've been on since March of 2020. Here's the other interesting statistic. 76%, 76% of all federal debt that has been issued since the pandemic again, began, again, that March 2020 date when they started doing $120 billion of bond buying per month. 76% of all federal debt that has been issued since the pandemic began has in fact been bought by the Federal Reserve. That's kind of like you know, kissing your sister, marrying your cousin, that kind of thing, if you stop. I mean, so here we are, we're issuing out a bunch of debt, funding all of this stuff, and at the end of the day, we're just simply buying our own debt. Who's paying that? Well, when they push down the interest rates, you're paying that, because you're paying that one could argue you're paying that through inflation, but in particular, you're paying that with the 0% that you're getting on your savings. The personal savings rate in the pandemic hit high numbers as recently as June. Personal savings rate was 9.4%. For perspective, it's only been above 10% like one month since 1993. So high, high savings rate, a lot of people holding on to cash and making nothing. Your government thanks you for that because that is what they are able to do by funding all of this stuff, by keeping interest rates low. You're not making anything on your savings and they thank you for that. Although I don't think they've sent out any thank you notes. Anyway, we're gonna take a break. When we come back, we're gonna talk about college drop-off season, hopefully not college dropout season, right? Uh, all that and more coming up next year on Dollars and Cents with Joel Garris of Nelson Financial Planning. Busy week ahead in the Garris household, heading up to Charlottesville to drop my middle son off to begin his college career at the University of Virginia. So like a lot of other parents as well, doing the same thing. Maybe you're heading to Gainesville, Tallahassee, Auburn, He's already up there, so I didn't really head there with him this year, but to places wherever you are heading, it is a big transition. It's also big dollars as well to pay for all of this. So we thought it only appropriate given that this week ahead features a lot of college 
drop-offs, a lot of college dorm move-ins to talk about, well, how do you fund that? Hopefully you've thought about that before you start packing up the car. And then in our next segment, we're going to talk particularly about some of the tax credits that come into play when you start to have those higher educational expenses. So welcome to Dollars and Cents, where we help you make sense out of all of life's financial decisions. We're Central Florida's longest running radio program, coming to you on a variety of networks throughout the Central Florida region. Also happen to be one of the top 25 financial planning podcasts on the World Wide Web. So if you missed the live show here this morning, you are certainly welcome to follow us on your favorite social media or podcast channel of choice. You can just find us simply by searching for Nelson Financial Planning. My name, of course, Joel Garris. I'm a certified financial planner, certified financial fiduciary at Nelson Financial Planning, where our team of certified financial fiduciary stands ready this week to help you change your life with a successful and cost-effective retirement plan. So heading off to college, dropping them off. What are the options to pay for it? Well, I suppose there's loans, and unfortunately, given the incredibly high cost of college these days, many folks find that they have to take out student loans in order to pay for it. Now, here's some things to remember about that student loan part. First, when you start to pay the student loans, there is a tax deduction for that student loan interest. And the beauty of that tax deduction is that that is what we refer to as a front page deduction, meaning that you can deduct the interest that you pay on your student loans without having to separately itemize your deduction. So that's sort of a one that you get if you are paying student loan interest no matter what. Now, remember, there are some income parameters that you have to be below in order to get that deduction. As a single person, that's below 85,000. Married couple, it's below 170,000. There's phase ups over the next few grand on both of those parameters, but basically those are the income limits to observe, particularly if you are trying to write off that student loan interest. We're not gonna get into the conversation about how much college has increased and the question that we've certainly raised on prior versions of this program of how can this be justified in terms of the rate of cost increase that colleges are charging in America today? It is double the rate of inflation and it just doesn't quite add up. But anyway, said we weren't gonna talk about that on this program, so we'll slide over to continuing the conversation of how you pay for it. So. One of the biggest things to remember about loans, and I think this is where people kind of get lost in the shuffle. There is a difference between a subsidized student loan and an unsubsidized student loan. If it's subsidized, that means the interest is getting taken care of for you. So it's not at getting added in to the outstanding balance of the loan. If it is unsubsidized, then that means at the end of the day, when you graduate four years from now, you will owe more on that loan than what you originally borrowed. Because when you borrow money, year one as a freshman, it's a loan. And it's a loan in year one. And if you don't start paying it until year four, well then they didn't give you a pass because it was unsubsidized, they didn't give you a pass on the interest. So this is the thing that I think a lot of people don't quite realize or maybe appreciate. If you, if you go three years, right? If you borrow that freshman year, graduate in four years, hopefully, right? Hopefully it's not five, but that's a long period of time for that interest to accrue. And it's not like the interest rates for student loans are as low as say mortgage rates, right? I mean, mortgage rates might be three or 4%. Student loans might be more like six or 7%. So that's a much higher level of interest that if you leave it and let it just continue to compound, then guess what? It winds up being 
that you owe a lot more on that loan than you realize. So be careful of that. You can find any way possible to at least have the interest payments be paid along the way to not be stuck with that big surprise. I know that that's tough to suggest, but just be aware that that's what's happening in the background on the student loans. Another very popular option, particularly here in Florida, is of course the prepaid tuition plans. Those are the plans that allow you to buy tuition credits at current prices at participating universities, right? So state of Florida has a prepaid plan. You buy it, uh, credits for a, a state school here in Florida. And the beauty of that, of course, is that it's one of those things where you probably wanted to do that earlier when the kids were younger, so you could lock in a lower cost. To do it now for this semester's tuition bill, it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right? Because it's not gonna be really any different because you're basically purchasing the tuition credits at the DEN current price. So it certainly makes sense if, if, if folks are, are, are younger. The way they work is you kind of buy a specific piece of college, right? Maybe it's tuition, maybe it's fees, maybe it's room and board, but that's generally kind of how they, they, they work. One of the downsides or the limitation is if they go, it only kind of returns the money if you cancel, if they get scholarships, then you get sort of the equivalent value, but, but it is somewhat limited in terms of the flexibility and in terms of being able to use it, has to be at that institution that's part of that prepaid plan. The other option would be uh, something like an educational savings account, and that's a pure investment account. So pros and cons on that, right? I mean, it's an investment account, so it's gonna, it's whatever money's in there is gonna be based upon how that investment did versus the prepaid where it's sort of like a, you get sort of like a guaranteed return, right? Because you bought it at the then current rates, and so you know what those numbers are. With a savings type of plan, it's gonna be an investment, so that means that you know there's gonna be a difference in terms of what the value is. But the trade-off there is that you can have those accounts grow at a much higher pace and ultimately use them for a much broader range of, of expenses. Now, the beauty of all of these is that while certainly you don't get like an immediate tax deduction, particularly here in Florida where there's no state income tax, some states uh, that have state income tax will give you maybe a little bit of a credit when you do these college savings type of plan. That obviously doesn't apply here in Florida. But the, the reality is you put the money in and it, it grows on a tax deferred basis and a tax free basis because when you use it for educational expenses, and again, you gotta use it for educational expenses, otherwise there's taxes, penalties, and stuff like that applies, then those types of, of accounts have that ability to grow tax-free and be used tax-free. So that's why it's important if you're gonna start one of these to start it early in order to maximize out the tax benefits of these types of, of savings plans. Now, again, an educational savings plan, 529 savings plan, uh, that's investment based obviously has a little bit more uh, uh, obviously has a little bit more versatility and you can use that for a range of educational expenses there is a maximum flexibility uh, or, or maximum contribution that you can make you can do up to 75,000 as a one time uh, contribution to a 529 savings plan that basically is a 5 year acceleration of what would normally be the normal gifting amount that you could give to a person. So that's where that 75,000 number comes from. And so those types of accounts allow you to save a, a tremendous amount of money. Uh, and if you're doing it when they're young, then obviously there's some great tax savings that, that comes with that. No real income parameters on it. So anybody's eligible to be able to do that. Uh, the other option that's sort of out there, which is pretty limited, is the Coverdell or Educational Savings Account. It's limited to $2,000 per year. You've got to have income below $95,000 as a single person, below $190,000 as a married couple, and you've got to use it all by 30. So that one generally not necessarily a big fan of, uh, but uh, certainly in terms of the greatest amount of flexibility to have that educational savings plan. That's a great way to be able to do that. The prepaid plan works well if you're certain that you know they're gonna stay in the state in which you've bought that prepaid. So those are some of the options in which to fund college. When we get back, we're gonna talk about some of the tax credits that you can get for these college expenses. Coming up next here on Dollars and Cents with Joel Garris of Nelson Financial Planning.
Back to college season. A lot of my contemporaries are dropping their kids off at school this coming week. I am joining the caravan as well, uh, dropping my middle son off up in Virginia at the University of Virginia. And in the last segment, so we were talking about, okay, so how do you, how do you fund that? And hopefully you've thought through that a little bit more, but one of the chief takeaways on that conversation in the last segment is watch out on, on the loan side of things. We understand a lot of people have to take loans to afford college these days, but understand that if it is an unsubsidized loan, then the interest is gonna to continue to accrue along the way over the course of the next few years until they start paying for it. That's why a lot of folks are graduating owing a lot more money than they think they did. If you're not participating in a college drop off this week and maybe you've got younger kids, great time to look at some of those other options, right? Whether it be a 529 college savings plan that gives you a lot of flexibility, but it's correlated directly to the investment side of things, or maybe a prepaid plan that locks in today's value of tuition on uh, college. So pros and cons on each of those, we talked a little bit about them in the last segment. If for some reason you missed it and wanna hear it again, as you know, we are a podcast as well. I uh, actually uh, recently named one of the top 25 financial planning podcasts in the World Wide Web. So make sure you check us out on our podcast channels and of course also our YouTube channel as well. All of that can be found by searching for Nelson Financial Planning on any of those social media or podcast platforms. My name, of course, Joel Garris. I'm a certified financial planner, certified financial fiduciary at Nelson Financial Planning, where we're gonna be featured on television next Sunday at noon on the program that is Best of Central Florida with Justin Clark and Michaela Nichols. We were the People's Choice winner. So very exciting stuff. Uh, make sure you listen or watch us on television next Sunday noon on uh, Channel 6, which is the local CBS uh, affiliate here in the greater Orlando market. So anyway, two main tax credits when we're talking about college and college saving and, and, and using money for those expenses. So there was a third uh, and it was called the tuition and fees deduction. It was around even for the 2020 tax year, but uh, was eliminated for the year 2021. It was basically an extra deduction that you were given for out-of-pocket college costs that were above sort of the maximum amount you could deduct through these other tax credits, or it was uh, that, that, that you income was a little bit too high to get full advantage of some of the credits, and so you were able to do this tuition and fees deduction. That one is uh, eliminated for 2021, so just set that one off to the side. And so basically, there are two main tax credits that you are afforded the opportunity to be able to take some of those college expenses and ultimately write them off. So first and foremost is the American Opportunity Credit. And we think this one is by far the more powerful of the two. So if you can get this one, go for this one because it's more valuable. How so? Well, it, it gives you a total tax credit of up to 2,500, but here's the real kind of unique part of it. The first two thousand dollars that you spend, so you don't have to spend a. It's not you don't have to spend a whole lot, but the first two thousand dollars that you spend, a hundred percent of that, can go towards making this tax credit a reality. So, so the first two thousand, basically, if you go to school, you're, the first two thousand under this tax credit winds up effectively being free. So when you think about how this tax credit plays out. That's exactly how it plays out on your tax return. The next 2,000, you can deduct up to 25% of the next 2,000 of expenses that you spend at college. 25%, 2,000, that's 500 bucks. There's your 2,500 total tax credit for the American Opportunity Credit. Effectively, it pays the first $2,000 of your college expenses. So pretty dramatic stuff. Now, some of the limitations. It's got to be the first four years. 
of college, and you have to be actively pursuing a degree. Again, those are the parameters that you've got to be able to use. It is refundable, meaning that if you don't actually owe any taxes, you can get up to $1,000 back in your pocket, and that's the refundable part of that tax credit. So that's also pretty unique that you are able to even get some money back in your pocket beyond what you would typically owe even for taxes. Similarly though, there are some income limits, right? Any of these great tax credits and things like that, you're only eligible for them if you meet the income limits. And those income limits are relatively on the lower side for the American Opportunity Credit. They start to phase out at about 80,000 if you're a single filer uh, for a married couple, it's about 160,000. So those are sort of the income parameters that allow you to become eligible for a for, uh, uh, for that American Opportunity Credit. Now, you can use it for tuition, but you can't use it for room and board. So again, all of these credits as with anything in the tax code, right? There's so many nuances, so many, you know, kind of you can do this, but not that. You gotta be below this, but not above that. There's definitely a lot more parameters to be thinking about, but bottom line on the American Opportunity Tax Credit for college, you can use it for tuition, not room and board. It's up to $2,500, particularly the first 2,000 is 100% of that, of, of that tax credit amount and it is refundable. The key, key components of that particular tax credit. A refundable tax credit is one that says, hey, even if you don't owe any taxes, you're still gonna get back that money uh, in your pocket. So that one's pretty powerful. It's gotta be the first four years though. So again, understand those parameters as well. Next one is the lifetime learning credit. Now this one, as the name suggests, lifetime, that means that you can use this at any point in time, as long as you are pursuing a, a career development or improving skills. The institution doesn't even need to be accredited. Uh, you don't have to be pursuing a degree. It's really meant to be uh, an opportunity for folks to get some tax savings if they are pursuing something that's going to help improve themselves. So the lifetime learning credit, as the name suggests, you can use that at any point during the course of your lifetime. You're not limited to it. The, the, the American Opportunity Credit, you get four bites of the apple at that, and then that's it. The lifetime learning credit, no such limitation like that. Uh, it is $2,000 max, so it's 20% uh, of up to 10,000 of expenses. So understand how that works, right? So if you spend $5,000 of expenses on the American Opportunity Credit, you'd get a $2,500 tax deduction under the lifetime learning, it's 20% of that amount. So it winds up only being uh, $1,000, 20% of, of, of five grand. So, or, so, so understand that it's 20% of the amount that you spent. I think I messed up on that example. Let me try it again. You spend 2,500, you spend $4,000, you get the full $2,500 credit under the American Opportunity Credit. You spend $4,000 under the lifetime learning, you only get 20% of that amount or $800. So you can see, again, American Opportunity Credit, much more valuable, but the lifetime learning credit, hey, it's a least it's available to you whether or not you're in your first four years of school and whether you're not, you're, you may not be pursuing a degree full time, but you still get that opportunity. As is always the case with any of these tax credits, there's some income limitations. You gotta be below 80,000. Uh, as a single filer and a below 160,000 as a joint uh, filer. So, so those are the two big credits. That third one, as we mentioned, the tuition fees deduction, that one is no longer, they eliminated that one because they adjusted up the income limit parameters on the lifetime learning credit. So those are kind of the big tax credits that are out there. So be aware as you do your taxes that there is some opportunity to potentially get some additional tax savings on your return by virtue of these tax credits. There are income limits on these, so you gotta watch that, so that may determine your eligibility, but the reality is that these are very valuable to be able to, to, be able to use to help reduce your tax bill. One other little caveat or sort of word of advice is you, you can't double dip, right? You can't use the same expenses 
uh, for, for both of these credits. You, in fact, can't use you know, d the, a double dip on both of the credits. You can't use the AOC and the lifetime learning on the same person. You could use them on different people, but you can't use them on the same person, nor can you use the same expenses either. So just watch out for that stuff uh, on how all of that plays out in your taxes. We're going to take a break. We come back. We're going to hit the last segment, give you some quick thoughts on how to break out of the cycle of living paycheck to paycheck. Coming up next here on Dollars and Cents with Joel Garris of Nelson Financial Planning. Welcome back to the program, ladies and gentlemen. This is Dollars and Cents. I am your host, Joel Garris of Nelson Financial Planning, where I'm a certified financial planner, certified financial fiduciary. We also have a team of certified financial fiduciaries at the office that stand ready this week to help you change your life with a successful and cost-effective financial plan. So last segment of the program, we thought we would give some general thoughts on how to break out of the cycle of living paycheck to paycheck. So many Americans are, are struggling with that. And particularly if you think about like inflation and some of the things that we were talking about earlier in the program. So we thought we would kind of end the show with some ideas or some suggestions that you might be able to implement this coming week to help you get on better financial track. And, and one of the first things that we that we talk about is this notion of paying yourself first. I, I think all too many people think of savings as that's what I do at the end of the month, right? After I've paid all my, my incomes come in, my money's come in, I've paid all my bills. Okay, now what's left over? That's the part I'm gonna save. And if you do that, you're you're constantly going to be having less to save because as with anything in life, right? If it's the last thing you think about, chances are you're not gonna be thinking about it enough. Same thing works with your finances. If it's the last thing you're gonna put money towards or the amount of money that you've got left over, then at the end of the day, there's gonna be less left over. So if you get in the habit of paying yourself first, then that's gonna put you in better financial shape. What does that mean? Well, it starts with maybe contributing to your employer plan at work, right? Just having that come right out of the paycheck, right off the top, so you don't even really see it. When the paycheck hits, take money that day off and put it into your savings account, whether that's into an investment account, or emergency savings account, whatever the case may be. The notion of paying yourself first is a great way to start that process of breaking out of the cycle of living paycheck to paycheck. Next up, got to pay more on those credit cards than just the minimum. Look, those credit cards, they represent purchases that you made in the past. And I understand that the shirt you bought was on sale when you bought it, and it was a great deal. But the problem is now, if you're just paying the minimum on it, you're paying more for that shirt because with an interest rate typical on credit cards of 18 to 20%, there goes your 20% off sale pretty darn quick because the credit card company is gonna be charging you that interest and that accrues at a much higher rate. So make sure you're really doing whatever you can to try and put more than just the minimum and really to get to the point where you're not operating on credit cards. In today's world, this next one is a tough one because I think with social media being what it is, it, this has always been one that's been a hard one, but this notion of keeping up with the Joneses or whoever your neighbors might be, the reality is that you look at what someone has and, oh, I want that, and they've got the new car and the bigger house and the pool and all, all that stuff, and you can get really caught up into that. And I think. I think social media has exacerbated that even more so where, you know, nobody ever posts bad stuff, right? They only post like good stuff. So it gives a very skewed perspective of what life looks like for many people. And so you really have to kind of take a step back and look at what you've got and, and balance that versus your income, balance that versus a, a, of expenses. The, the notion of living your own life richly cannot be understated when we start talking about these kinds of things um, when it comes to expenses and uh, how that all plays out and how that plays out in terms 
of perception. Harsh reality is there's always going to be somebody with a bigger boat, bigger house, bigger income. It's the reality. So if you're constantly getting into that comparison game, uh, you're going to wind up relatively disappointed throughout life. So try and stay away from that. Emergency savings. Certainly something we've talked a lot about on this program, the importance of having an emergency savings account because emergencies happen. And if you haven't planned for that, you know, an emergency savings account, then you can wind up falling behind and really getting back in, into a slippery slope habit of living paycheck to paycheck. So you have an emergency savings account for those emergencies. But also, I think a lot of people fail to think about there are some expenses in life that aren't recurring every month that sort of, but are recurring on a regular basis. Things like insurance, things like car repairs, things like, things like property taxes. Those aren't necessarily monthly bills, but they're annual bills. And so you do need to be saving money each and every month to try and make sure that you have those covered as 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 well. So again, those are some of the things to be uh, to be thinking about if you're trying to break out of the cycle of living paycheck to paycheck. Other things would be translating dollars into real action, right? So so into real action. So what that means is that if you say, oh, I've got a budget of three hundred dollars a month for eating out, but take a minute and and translate that to okay, well. How many meals is that? How many drinks is that? How many trips to Starbucks is that? In order to really get a handle on what that represents. I think far too often, even folks that do budgets and attempt to follow them and then you know, they, they, you know, they run into difficulty following the budget, I think the biggest part of that is they're not translating those dollars to real life actions, right? So if you say I'm gonna spend $300 a month uh, for, for eating out, you don't translate that to what that actually means in terms of sitting down for lunch, or sitting down for dinner, going out to coffee, going out to drinks, then it doesn't mean anything. So what does that $300 translate? Is that five lunches, five dinners, two trips to Starbucks, or what's the, what's the math, if you will, on that? So it's important to translate dollars to uh, real actions. Watch your ongoing subscriptions, right? I mean, those are kind of the things that who, who doesn't have a subscription that they're paying for that they don't really use. So use that as an opportunity to really look at that. And then lastly, review your financial documents, tax returns, bank statements, investment statements, credit card statements. Review those so you have an understanding and appreciation of exactly what's going on in your life financially so that hopefully you can break out of the cycle of living paycheck. The paycheck. We're going to wrap it on up. I got some packing to do, or at least my middle son's got some packing to do. And then we got to figure out how to get all of that in the car for the trip up to Charlottesville. We hope if you're doing the same thing that it all goes smoothly. We're going to wrap it up and be get on out of here. Thanks for listening to the program. This has been Dollars and Cents with your host, Joel Garris of Nelson Financial.